Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. Happy Good Shepherd Sunday, Working Preachers, which is the fourth Sunday of Easter, always in the lectionary, this year falling on April 21, 2024, and also Earth Day. So got a lot of got a lot of talk to talk about. Our texts are Acts chapter 4, 5 through 12, Psalm 23, no surprise there. Second reading is 1 John 3, 16 through 24. We continue our reading through the 1 John letter and then John 10, 11 to 18, where Jesus actually says he is the good shepherd. Well, and your commentary gave us all a great introduction to uh, the, the way that uh, the lectionary presents the Good Shepherd Discourse to us or mangles the Good Shepherd Discourse <laughs> for us. So that's, uh, that's, that's helpful. But this is not a bad, as, as, as the options go, this is a pretty good one because he actually says, I'm the Good Shepherd, right? Well, and I've said this before, because 10.1 to 10, it, the, really the primary image is Jesus is the gate or the door. But right. I suspect that we did not have as many door or gate hymns. So the decision went with, of the RCL was to go with Good Shepherd Sunday instead of Door Sunday. I, I feel every time you say that, Caroline, you're trying to get the musicians to write some door music. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I say, the same. I say that. Can I, I, ask a, can I ask a John question that might help for today and even for the next few weeks? Because sure. we're, we're in John now until Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So belonging mm -hmm. is a word that you use, which mm -hmm. is a word that uh, I believe I know a book titled that. Mm -hmm. It's a word that I think is kind of popular these days. It's, it's a better word than inclusion, for example, when we talk about communities. Mm -hmm. And John's language is abide, mm -hmm. but there's also language in the farewell discourse about things like vines and about mm -hmm. like literally almost not quite belonging, doesn't use that language, but being Jesus's own, mm -hmm. being God's own. So I guess my question is how does, like to say belonging, that's, that's an interpretation. That's kind of taking some modern mm -hmm. categories and mapping that onto John, which is of course is great, but is that right? Is it more than just feeling loved and welcomed? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. is there an obligation attached to this belonging or is it just to be accepted as you are and to be enfolded in God's love? Not just in the sense I'm minimizing it. I'm just trying to like, mm -hmm. and this yeah. is the wrong question to ask on Good Shepherd Sunday, tell me, but like, what does it mean to be his own? And what does it mean to be, you know, a sheep that he cares about and lays down his life for? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, you know when I when I think about belonging, I it's for me it ends up being it it, it yeah it when you think about it in our current culture it become it's a kind of uh, popular word. But I I think what I want to do is imagine how does John define how does John help us think about what belonging could be and should be, uh, and so then how does how does this passage actually shape then our assumptions about what belonging uh, can look like and what it can mean. And so it's less about that mapping of the belonging onto as it is, uh, as it is, how, you know, the abiding, being in relationship with Jesus, the being one of his own, how how does that then help us expand this understanding of what belonging looks like and what belonging feels like? And I definitely think that there is a a, a responsibility because because part of belonging, right, is also being in community. And so it's uh, yeah, you're one of Jesus' own, but there's that constant reminder that you're being you're part of our larger whole now. And that is what belonging is as well. It's not individualized. Uh, it's not just individualized, but it's this communal, uh, communal reality. And anytime you're brought into community, I think you have responsibilities. Uh, you have, you have, you have, you, I don't, maybe not owe the community, but you then begin to see what, how am I a part of this community and what am I contributing to it? And that's where you really see the farewell discourse play out, right? Uh, that we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks is 
uh, as how is it that that being being in this community of Christ, belonging to this community of Christ, is is in in part uh, in part caring for one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, deeply caring for one another, loving one another, laying down your life for one another. Uh, so those aren't, you know, those aren't, um, th- those aren't easy things. <laughs> so that's, that's the, that's the wider sense, I think, of what, of what Jesus is, is talking about. And part of that is, is caring for one another, the responsibility to one another, to uplift and uphold one another, but it's also how did then you carry that out into the world? So I don't know if that answers your question, Matt, but that's kind of how I think about it. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate the question. Um, It makes me think, as you were talking, I was thinking of a a colleague of mine um, who, um, as a Hispanic uh, colleague uh, working uh, in a primarily uh, identified as white institution, um, he said um, inclusion um, felt like being a, a, a foster child forever, mm. um, never adopted, uh, so that mm. um, you you th- in some ways you're you never belong. You you are always the outsider, welcomed, included, but not truly belonging. Um, and and that was an interesting uh, a way of describing it. You know, what is the difference between uh, adoption and and fostering? Using that metaphor, um, in the language that I often will use, and this gets along with uh, that witness you were talking about uh, uh, last week, uh, community of witness, uh, Matt, in the sense of I I can be a mascot, which means I'm included. And oh, look, we got one. Or I can be with the community in its ministry. And then I belong because I'm part of the community doing what the community is doing. And so that that for me is that distinction, um, which that that's the way I would I would bring together what you were describing, Caroline. Yeah. Thanks for that. Helpful. And that's why uh, and and when you think about what's at stake for the man born blind, that's what he becomes one of Jesus' disciples. Exactly. So then, then that means that the rest of the you know the rest of the gospel is for him, right? The rest of what Jesus will talk about in terms of of responsibility to one to one another, um, loving one another as I have loved you, he's brought into that into that reality, mm-hmm. uh, and. Uh, and he's not just, you know, he's not just a mascot or he's not just a uh, foster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, that's, that's really what I was trying to get. Uh, yeah. You know, no, that's what I heard. Get across in the commentary. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's all really helpful to me. I, I, I really like the, the, the idea of how does John contribute to our understanding of that. So in, in, in churches, other theological contexts, we're not just kind of borrowing ideas from the culture without thinking about what's distinctive about a Christian expression of, uh, of, this, of this value, of this virtue. And I also like the idea of the individual and the communal, because it's, uh, especially when we add, when we get to like Psalm 23, for example, which strikes me as a very individualistic understanding of one's relationship to God, which is fine, but then to think about what does that mean to be part of a flock or to be part of something yes. <laughs> bigger. Uh, and I, th- I see how that's there in John for sure. But yeah, it's significant. I think we'll just come back to it more and more. And for me, it's primarily about protection, I think, here in John 10. At least that's part of it, which is a, a, an interesting concept for moderns like us who don't experience threat in perhaps as intense a way as somebody like the author of Psalm 23 might have, or or Jesus' disciples, who are all of a sudden now, as John is being written, very much um, minoritized in some kind of a community and wider culture that might see them as very suspect. Of course, some people are at more risk on a regular basis, but I think the intensity there in John 10 is something a preacher has to impress upon a lot of audiences who think, 
I woke up this morning, I got to church, no problem. You know, nobody threw rocks at me. Uh, that we don't soft pedal this notion of being made secure as one of God's own. Right. Matt, I really appreciate that. That invites a different homiletical move with this text. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, did uh, a, um, a, a workshop. Um, and one of the questions was uh, uh, folks, whether or not folks felt like they could present an opposing idea. And um, there was uh, a hesitation to do that, um, that in some ways might be the reality in our contemporary moment of, of, of being on the edge or at the point where we might be ready to experience what uh, that need for safety um, that uh, the psalmist is, is describing here. Um, I'd, I'd, if you hadn't have said that, Matt, I probably wouldn't have put that comment in line with this text. Yeah. There may be some folks already feeling on the edge or ostracized or at risk. Oh, yeah. When I'm with preachers, I hear this all the time. Yes. Right now, and I think it's going to just probably, at least in our country, probably is going to escalate in the next um six months and mm -hmm. we're talking about it at the festival of homiletics in about a month from now and mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so maybe before you preach this you should think about it for yourself <laughs> as a preacher right who might feel at risk in the pulpit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you want to talk any more about uh psalm 23 i mean it's oh i thought we were talking about john 10 <laughs> <laughs> psalm i wrote the commentary so you all can uh. <laughs> Um, but the more you want to say about John 10, Caroline? Well, I, what? <laughs> no, I, I think the other thing that I would just point out that I, that I talk about in my commentary is how, when you connect this to the, the healing of the man born blind, there's this, uh, there's tends to be this emphasis on seeing as believing, uh, and that it's really, it's, you know, it's his sight that makes the difference, but, uh, but that the fact that he listened to Jesus, uh, and, and that was the first thing that he did. He didn't see Jesus. He heard Jesus tell him go wash in the pool of Siloam and he did, and he came back seeing. And so to add those verses at the end of, uh, end of the discourse, why listen to him? That's the question of the discourse. Yes. Why listen to Jesus? Well, you, you, you get healed, you're brought into community, you're protected, you're, uh, you're brought into the fold when, when there is danger. Uh, and that really goes back to, and I think that could be a wider, why a wider qu homiletical question. Why, li why listen to the good shepherd? Mm -hmm. uh, what is a good shepherd saying that you should listen to? Uh, so that would be maybe another direction I would take. And it, and it really goes back to, I'm sure I've said this before, but it really goes back to the mother of Jesus where she says, you know, do whatever he tells you. And, and because when you do what Jesus, <laughs> when you follow Jesus words, when you follow the good shepherd, life and abundance result. And, and that might be, as you were just saying, as we were just talking about in terms of the of the competing, conflicting uh, times that we are in now, what voices are you listening to? What are the voices that are about protection and safety and life and abundance? And what are the voices that are the opposite of that? And so I think that 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 would be the one other thing I would say. I find it challenging to to work with those aspects of the John 10 text uh, during Eastertide. In Eastern particular, you know what I mean? Like this is all great stuff. This is evergreen year long. This is, but like, how does the resurrection inform this? I guess is the question as a preacher I'm looking for. Mm. Um, I mean, at the very end, he does say, I, I'm, I have the authority to lay down my life and take it up again. But a lot of this is about a shepherd who's willing to die for the sake of the security of sheep. That metaphor doesn't necessarily need a resurrection. You know what I mean? But the fact that this is a shepherd who lays down his life and then gets his life back or gets, it moves into new life. You know what I mean? I think there's a, just an interesting theological wrinkle so that you can place this in the current season in a powerful way. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I'm thinking about it in terms of our earlier conversation uh, of those who feel at risk 
to, to speak um, what they believe the text is saying. One, Caroline, I always appreciate your putting us back into the fullness of the the text uh, of the the unfolding revelation, and not just the particular um, lines or single ideas. Um, and and so reading this as a post resurrection story with this idea of being a part of a community that bears witness. I'm just lingering on Caroline's words for, why should I listen to this? And it becomes so that I can understand maybe the full uh, capacity of this God to form a community that can do these things in the spheres of influence we have here and now. We aren't shepherds. Uh, Well, some are, but I'm from Chicago. Um, you know, I shepherding is not on my I, I want to learn how to do that list. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so what our spheres of influence are where we might have to bear witness to the presence of God, the work of God in Jesus Christ in a context that is reluctant to hear it or um, uh, antagonistic against it. And what happens, I'm trying to remember how you said it, Caroline, but when we give ourselves over to this uh, God, the power of bringing life abundantly. Um, Mm -hmm. You said it better, but that was... Well, that's where, you know, you, you, you really can't, I mean, you can't read this passage without 1010. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And, that, you know, that for John, the resurrection is, the resurrection stands behind, uh, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. It stands behind, I have the power to take it up again, but not only the resurrection, the ascension. So that's the, I mean, it, a, a preacher could kind of look forward to, or look backward to John 20 and Mary Magdalene's confession is not what Jesus told her to say, which is, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And so the the ascension could actually be an, uh, the, the assumption of the entirety of the resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, all as one standing behind all of this or behind, you know, the foundation for everything that's being said here is, uh, is, could be another entry into what resurrection means and what difference does it make that resurrection is not the end actually it's not like the ultimate at least for john it's the ascension uh and so that could be another that could be another direction too a preacher could take we should go on all right let's do it i'm just gonna point out i know nothing about shepherding either so i'm not the only one okay (laughs) i grew up in the suburbs and yeah no sheep no, I wrote an article once that started off everything I ever learned about shepherding. I learned from my dog, who was a German shepherd, but that's, uh, that's as far as I got. But anyway, Acts four. Yeah. So you heal somebody at Solomon's portico, and thousands of people show up to listen to you preach. Uh, you get arrested in at least in Acts four. Mm-hmm. And what's maybe vital to know is you're arrested by certain people, and so. Uh, Acts is quite clear. This is the the chief priest mm-hmm. and the Sadducean party, which um, people have forgotten who they are. This is a very small group of elites who are aristocratic families, largely wealthy. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but they are also very much in league with uh, Roman authority, and it's their job to police Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And make sure that everything goes according to a nice smooth plan. Otherwise, the Romans will be unhappy with that. So their motive is interesting here. It seems to be more than just curiosity, but there's also the temple itself has become this contested space Mm -hmm. in that this is where Peter and John just happened to be preaching because this is where the man was healed and, and they're drawing a crowd. So the people kind of get a sense for what's going on here in terms of the conflict. Some people say this is largely a staging of a kind of prophetic Jewish movement <clears throat> over against a priestly Jewish movement, that this is not Christianity versus Judaism. But you've got here different 
kinds of currents that we are, again, if you read the Old Testament, you see plenty of those kinds of right. currents where right. prophets and priests are not necessarily competing religious visions, but certainly not religious visions that neatly cohere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's just setting the scene. Yeah. Now, I really appreciate that, uh, Matt, in terms of the clarity that these are two um, Jewish ideas, um, you know, that, that it's not Christianity versus Judaism, but it is, these are two Jewish trains of thought. Right. I, I, I really appreciate that. I, I hadn't attended to that before. <laughs> Look at that. You taught me something today. More than that, but. Yeah, work here is done. <laughs> well, and one thing that I, I think is really interesting about this passage with regard to the questioning of the healing and, uh, you know, a good deed done to someone who was sick and asked how this man has been healed. And then the claim about there is salvation in no one else for is, there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. So it really invites, Peter, why are you talking about salvation here? It, it, is what you just did at a salvific act, uh, is that part of what salvation looks like? Uh, to 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 be healed, and so that's one direction I would. I mean that, that you know that that connection uh, to to imagine to help people think about or why you know what is Peter doing in that moment to say uh, that we know salvation in Jesus, and then how was this how was this then an act a visible act of what salvation can look like. You say that I, I just a uh, few weeks ago uh, was teaching um, uh, this uh, being from uh, Luke's account of Jesus um, uh, reading from uh, Isaiah, you know, this is what I've come to do. Is that Luke? Yeah, yeah Luke 4. Thank you. Luke 4. Okay. And uh, he says, um, uh, and, and I, I said to the students, I said, um, you know, what do you think about when you think of salvation? And it's always, you know, heaven when I die, I'm a Christian, you know, that sort of work. And yet what Jesus came to do, which we say is he came to save us. Well, this is what Peter's just done mm -hmm. um, to set the captives free, to heal. to, And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that I love that homiletical thread, uh, Caroline, that um, just helping us recognize um, the true embodiment of what Jesus' work does for us here and now, not, you know, an idea of what happens after we die. Yeah. Um, the threat, the threat that uh, I actually thought you were going to lift up one, and I'm really glad you didn't, um, is um, you were talking about the ascension, um, and. Uh, at the ascension, there's uh, this promise of uh, the Spirit, and uh, it says here that Peter's words, all that G that Peter is explaining here, um, we're told he was filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and so he spoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th there's a, a reminder reminder for us that um, Jesus sends. Um, according to the creed proceeding from the Father and the Son, the Spirit. Um, and it is that presence of God where we are enabled to be this community of witnesses. And if over the past few weeks you've brought any of those threads, this is one way where uh, you might uh, uh, weave those together in uh, this witness that Peter has, um, Peter is making. and. Um, He's forming a community right now, to use your words, a community of listeners. And I think the other dynamic here that's curious is that I that I would maybe explore in a sermon is when are we resistant to acts of salvation or uh, when 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 do we question or wonder or even reject the moments where God raises from the dead? Mm -hmm. Not not literally uh, necessarily, but but how is again this person liberated? Right, going back to going back to Luke four, and and that because that's exactly what happens with 
with Jesus' first sermon mm-hmm. or Jesus' first words in Luke, Resistance. where he has this you know lovely quote from Isaiah, but then actually says, "Who will be liberated?" and they want to throw him off a cliff. So uh, that's you know that what is the, what is it about? Uh, these, you know, resurrection moments that we then question and reject and, uh, and that make us, you know, uncomfortable or we, or yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine to escort Jesus to the cliff because we don't want to hear that. <laughs> That's another direction I would maybe powerful explore. Wow. Okay. First John. That, yeah. That, that was, that's woo. <laughs> yeah. First John still. <laughs> Well, this is this is where we begin to specifically talk about the love that uh, you mentioned last week. Mm-hmm. We continue at this point. Um, this is this is love. This is the expression of love um, that um, one would lay down their life, uh, that one would sacrifice themselves for another. There's a point at which, when we are talking about Jesus clearly, we are talking about uh, a. Um, a literal laying down of his life. Um, when I think of uh, the civil rights, um, uh, the generation of civil rights workers like um, Martin Luther King and um, Megar Evans, um, who literally lost their life um, in in offering um, this alternative way of uh, forming a community of belonging, in this case, to this nation. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and 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 maybe I should add in that not that I want anyone to to have to lose their life, but metaphorically maybe what does it mean to say that I might have to sacrifice something mm-hmm. in order to hold true, mm-hmm. um, to have integrity? Um, uh, t- too much of our silence, uh, too much of our not saying everything is to save face, um, not because we're afraid we're going to physically die, but because we are afraid that we will in some way lose status, position, belonging. Yeah, and I think there, yes, exactly, Joy. And I think there are two things in this text that that really lift that up and uh and as a as a potential theme if you go back to this is not in the lectionary but if you go back to verse 14 which is before verse 16 where the pericope starts mm-hmm. whoever does not love abides in death that is a really <laughs> strong statement and the verb there is meno, and you know whether or not this is written by John. That's a whole other podcast or whatever. But but it's but it it, it meno typically has such a positive connotation in Johannine literature of abiding. We talked about this right earlier. But a, who or does not love abides in death. That the opposite of love um, is death. <laughs> and uh, and then also. And by this, we know that we are from the truth. And that gets at what you were talking about, Joy, is that this truth is not an abstract truth, but it's laying down your life because your life is founded, grounded in, based on this revelation of God and Jesus Christ. That's what's at stake. And so where where is it that you are laying down your life for that truth, uh, and and that that God's revelation in Jesus is fundamentally about love, and if that's not if that's not where where that love isn't happening, that love leads to death, and mm-hmm. that's that's where you stand up and say no. <laughs>